Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's my pleasure once again to welcome my partner in film, my partner in life, my partner in every imaginable way, my dear, precious wife, Lisa, as we consider together how to curate your movie library. Mm. Although, once again, we've done this a time or two, we're not going to be talking about a movie today. We're going to be talking about a series And this particular series, we are not very far in. We are maybe at five or six from season one, and we are nevertheless confident enough uh, how much we're enjoying it to uh, uh, not only talk about it, but commend it to people. This particular uh, series is called Grantchester. Now, If you've never heard of it, don't be surprised, because lots of people have never heard of it, although those who have heard of it tend to like it. He said it's got a 95% uh, rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, It came up in conversation with a friend yesterday. and friend. Yes, as soon as I said the the name, he just... Knew the name of the series. And went on, and the characters, and the situations, and... way far ahead of us. Right. (laughs) And this one, this was one that we found because... Uh, we're, we were looking for something fairly specific. I like BBC. Yes, you like BBC, and I like mysteries. mysteries. And uh, this would fall under the category of what we call a cozy. Mm-hmm. Uh, a cozy is a mystery, uh, or, uh, a whodunit, mm-hmm. that's not really high on the graphic violence. That's not, you know, something like Murder, She Wrote, or Matlock, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Uh only this is BBC and uh, has that feel to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's a mystery uh, masterpiece theater uh, production mm-hmm. and uh, set in the 50s, probably. Yeah, um, 1953. Yep. Uh, and it tells the story of a, a surprising partnership between a police detective uh, who's very down-to-earth, very, very gruff. yeah gruff, uh, probably not from the best background, but but improving himself, and he's now a detective. And his partner in solving crime is the local vicar, Sydney. Uh, who, if you don't know what a vicar is, he's the pastor of the local church there, the Church of England Church in this little uh, village not far from Cambridge, and. Uh, one of the things that you'll learn as you watch this is, uh, how do I put this? He's very worldly. Yeah, he is very worldly, and and that's not that unusual, right? Uh, particularly in the Church of England. Yeah. Uh, he is uh, given to drinking, and not just drinking, but drinking too much. He smokes, and uh, there's even... Uh, so far and already yes a, yeah. a, 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 a yes uh that said like so often with the english he's a charming guy yeah he's charming. he is and he is uh he's not like a um uh, well, so many of these murder mystery guys that aren't detectives mm-hmm. are sort of like Sherlock Holmes in the sense that they're just really geniuses, really insightful. What What's kind of funny about this particular show is their, uh, what's the word for it, their pattern, their standard operating procedure is the solution comes when a key phrase is just mentioned uh, sort of it's uh, coincidentally. Mm-hmm. Yes, and it, and it sparks a thought in his head. Or it sparks 
that comment being made by somebody else earlier in the show. Yeah, yeah. it's involved in the crime. Yes, and uh, and then it goes to unpack it. Uh, there's some really fun characters. Uh, the the vicar has a, a caretaker. Uh, older grumpy woman <laughs> who uh, takes care of the vicarage. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has an associate pastor who, uh, well, and that brings us to another difficulty with it. Uh, dear, I, I'm not the kind of guy who is really, really impressed by radical attempts at uh, what's called verisimilitude. There are people who've made movies, sweetheart, where... Uh, it might be a western it might be set in 1890 and when they build the set they will only use nails that are exactly like the nails from 1890 and the nails are driven into the wood you'll never see them Mm -hmm. and i just think that's crazy so i i don't I'm, i'm not that scrupulous that said i get annoyed enough when there are sort of politically correct messages in movies but when they're politically correct and anachronistic, it drives me nuts. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's a uh, you know a gun-toting uh, girl cowboy, mm-hmm. I'm just thinking, come on. There's a speech by Katie von Bora, the wife of Martin Luther, in the modern Luther movie that uh, is just straight out of something Oprah would say. I mean, just really strong feminist stuff now katie von bora was a strong woman as she should be and that's a good thing but it was really really out of place and so in the same way in this particular uh program we've seen already in just a few episodes a lot of uh sort of pro homosexual uh i'd say propaganda mm-hmm. uh uh in with respect to some of the characters. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, that's what reminded me of that. I started going down with the characters. I like the uh, the associate pastor. I can't remember what they call him in, in the Church of England, but uh, he's got that issue <laughs> uh, that he's, well, maybe dealing with, maybe not. Uh, yeah, that hasn't been uncovered yet. Right. But characteristics. Yeah, and so, uh, again, you've got these characters. You get this this sense of immersion into this little village you know it's it's like um you get the same thing when you watch uh all creatures great and small mm-hmm. uh or even call the midwives i mean there's, there's something very appealing and attractive of this small uh english Quite village nice. yeah uh and so we've we've very much enjoyed that uh but there's also you know, drama. There's real hardship. I mean, there, this is not; uh, these are not cardboard characters. These are these are complex people, including not just uh, Sydney with his sins, um, but the inspector and his struggles with situations in his family. Mm-hmm. Are you putting up with it? Are you enjoying it? You know, it's always a challenge when you think about walking with Christ and keeping your eyes from evil and your ears from evil, um, you know, it's, it's, we could completely eradicate television. Mm -hmm. We don't really watch any television except when we sit down and we decide we're going to watch a movie with us or we do something with the kids. It's not something that's ever on. Right. And there's oftentimes, I'll say to you, you know, Derek, I, I don't want to see that. Right. I don't want to see that in my spirit. I don't find it funny. You know, uh, we don't want to hear F-bombs, and I certainly don't want to hear them all over the movie. Right. Um, but I do think what I like about this particular series is the humanity of all the characters. Well said. And it's, you know, you... you you're, when you attend the church, you know whether it's the Church of England or the church down the street, you see the pastor when he gets up to give his speech to the church, when he's preaching the gospel. And what he's trying to do is walk it out. And you do see where um, maybe certain cardinal sins um, are okay in that role, but you do see the struggle of humanity. And not just with the quote, 
Christian because he still feels devout to God. Right. Even though he's polluting his temple and Mm -hmm. violating the word of God. Mm -hmm. And it's a very strange dichotomy to look at that and say, well, then all Christians should do that and be okay with it. That isn't the essence so much as seeing these are real people's lives um, portrayed. Really? Walking it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And seeing what burden it puts on the relationship. You know, he had a girlfriend and money doesn't come in as a vicar and the father of the love of his life doesn't approve of him. So she's having to love another guy that she doesn't love. So, I mean, we see, we can see that in terms of what we see in today's world. Yeah. We can see a lot of people struggling to really know their identity and, and hate who they really are and they find their value in their job and then they drink Mm -hmm. to appease that because there really isn't value you know there's so Mm -hmm. much running and hiding that we do in our lives and i think when we see it on the screen it's even more uh evident of those truths just excellent excellent summary excellent show uh we may come back to it in some future uh segments because we plan to continue to watch it uh, as always, we would love to hear from any of you who've seen it or who start watching it. Let right, us know what you yeah. think, uh, if, if our assessment is on, on, on track or on target. Sweetheart, I appreciate you being with me. I appreciate you watching this with me. I, again, appreciate you helping me uh, have some higher standards uh, on what we put before us. I, I'm, I'm, I'm learning to appreciate the gentleness uh, as much as I am the mystery mm-hmm. uh, because of you and I thank you for that and as always I love you sweetheart I love you too babe I honestly don't know how we do it but we do there's an expression that says birds of a feather flock together When I showed up as a freshman at Grove City College in the fall of 1982, my expectation was that everyone there was there for the same reason that I was. I was there to get a better education in Reformed theology and free market economics. Imagine my surprise to learn that there were many, many students there who had no interest in either one. And yet, those who did... I found them. I don't know how I found them, but I found them. I found myself in something of a ideological click. I went to the right Bible studies where we learned the right things, and I cultivated relationships with the right students, the right families, the right faculty. And when I did, I didn't so much meet someone, but I kept hearing about this someone. This circle of friends that I hooked up with had just the previous spring lost their ideological leader. He graduated and was uh, at that point in law school. And I I never met them there personally, face to face, but they would all say to me, oh, R.C., oh, R.C., if only you were here last year, if only you were here last year, if only you had known this fellow, you would have loved this fellow. You're so much like this fellow, yada, 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 yada. Well, again, I never met this fellow face to face, but I have had the blessing of conversing with him And I have had the blessing of reading some of his work. And he is this week's hero you never heard of. Now, as per usual, some of you may have heard of him. He is, after all, a a published author. And uh, he was a a strong leader in an organization uh, many of you may be familiar with, the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. The man's name is Chris Klicka. 
If you do remember or know the name, then you'll know that Chris has gone on to his reward. That one of the reasons that Chris was a hero to me was because he handled uh, his illness so very faithfully. I believe it was muscular or uh, multiple sclerosis that ultimately took his life, uh, put him in a wheelchair for uh, maybe the last 10 years of his life, and he never stopped, he never complained, he never whined. Uh, he remained faithful and strong and diligent, and I had the blessing of watching that uh, from afar. It was during that time uh, that we actually finally got a chance to know each other a little bit, uh, conversing on the phone and communicating uh, via, co via correspondence because he uh, actually asked me to write an endorsement for uh, one of his books, and I was happy to do so. And, and to tell him about, hey, you know, the, the semester after you were gone, I showed up and everybody was saying, Chris Clicka, Chris Clicka, Chris Clicka. And... Uh, I know why. Chris Clicka, he had this unbelievably rare combination of two qualities that we tend to see as being at odds with each other. First of all, Chris was a deeply gentle man. Very kind, very tender-hearted, very patient, very compassionate, not the kind of guy that you would expect to have yell at you. Never would never happen. But he was also fierce. He was also loyal, dogged. He was a man who would not let go. You know, really, really sort of skyrocketed uh, my estimation of him was... Uh, a lengthy extended article that he'd written for homeschooling today, sorry, homeschooling defense association, homeschool legal defense associations, uh, magazine, because, uh, the state of Alaska had passed a law, uh, by which it was possible, uh, for a person to homeschool, uh, all year long at home and have all of their books provided, all their curriculum provided, their computers provided, all of these things provided by the state. And uh, the way it worked out for the state was that the student was counted as a, a in the schools. And it was a real, genuine, understandable temptation. You can look at... Uh, the problem with state education is not what's in the curriculum, but what's missing from the curriculum. That it's not what it says, it's what it doesn't say. And that if you take that curriculum and you can add what needed to be added, then you'd be okay. So you, so you homeschool, you take their books, you go through their curriculum, and you, you pour some Jesus on top of it all, and boy, won't that go well. And it would be perfectly understandable, given Chris's position of leadership in the largest homeschooling organization in the in the world to walk lightly and carefully and try to straddle the fence on the issue that's not what he did he was straightforward he was clear he was bold he was direct he was gentle but he told the constituency do not do this do not do this. You, are, you, you may as well just walk your child down the street to the local government school. I called him said, Chris, I can't believe this. This is so straight. I, I mean, this is not, uh, you know, careful and nuanced. This is clear and straightforward. Did you have any pushback on this? And he said, no, I didn't have any pushback at all. And he was just grateful for the opportunity. And uh, I mean, he had pushback from readers, most assuredly, but not from the organization. And even in that conversation, even in talking about the people who did push back, the, the readers who were upset with him, he spoke about them with kindness and with grace. Chris was a father of many. He was a loving wife, uh, husband. Uh, 
And as I've said, he's gone on to his reward. But he remains a hero to me. Thank you for listening as I have the opportunity to speak well of him. I've always said that if you were to give me the who are you in the hundred acre wood quiz, the answer for me would be obvious. I don't need to take the quiz to know the answer. My uh, spirit animal is Eeyore. There are other people out there who have been given the gift of enthusiasm, who've been blessed with that capacity to uh, see the glasses half full. These are the kind of people who don't enjoy movies or prefer this restaurant or that. Instead, they live in the realm of the superlative. They want me to watch the greatest movie ever made or to eat the greatest meal ever served. Their strength is the ability to give hearty thanks. My strength is keeping things in perspective. God blesses us mightily all the time. But sometimes he blesses us more than other times. We don't want our righteous gratitude for the former to cast a shadow on the objective goodness of the latter. We must, in the words of St. Augustine, learn to love ordinately. For those of you who, like me, have forgotten more math than you remember, try to remember this, that there are at least two different kinds of numbers cardinal numbers and ordinal numbers. The former cardinal numbers, they simply count one, two, three. Those are cardinal numbers. The latter ordinal numbers work in relationship to each other. First, second, third. St. Augustine told us that all sin is a failure to love ordinately. We love this more than we should, that less than we should, and so find ourselves in a position of needing to repent. I love my wife, and I love ice cream. That these are both love relationships doesn't mean that I have escaped the problem of sin. If I love ice cream more than my wife, if it is first and she is second, I cannot wash away my sin with the cultural wash of love. The Bible explains this kind of temptation. Grass is a wonderful thing. Flowers even more so. Both, however, fade away. It is the word of the Lord that endures forever. And this is what we need to set before our eyes, what we need to feast upon. Movies and restaurants come and go. What we need, what our children need, is that which will not only outlast the latest these things, but will outlast the mountains and the seas, which is the word of God. The wisdom of this world, because it is objectively foolishness, is always changing. That's why, friends, we're told that when you put your baby to bed, you need to put your baby to sleep on their back. No, wait, on their stomach. No, on their back. No, on their side. 
That's why we're told one year that oatmeal is good for you. And the next year told oatmeal is bad for you. When we're tossed to and fro by these changing winds of doctrine, we show ourselves to be fools. It doesn't matter how bright green it may be. It doesn't matter how helpful for feeding cows. Because at the end of the day, grass withers. No matter how fragrant the scent, no matter its purported healing properties, flowers fade. The word of our Lord, however, endures forever. When we feed upon it, we feed upon life. When we are instructed in its wisdom, we're building our foundations on the rock. It's true that the world may sniff at our choices. They may fear that we've missed out. If, however, we stand on the wisdom of God, on his word, we will stand against whatever comes down the pike, whatever his future holds. The latest and the greatest, that's just the next thing on the ash heap. The tried and the true word that lasts forever. Hang on to that which cannot slip from your hands. The words of life. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsprouljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.